Well, you folks are better behaved than my students. <laughs> Welcome to the Campus Community Colloquium. My name is Wendell Stevenson. I'm one of the co-organizers of the Campus Community Colloquium, and I'm a philosophy teacher here at Fresno City College. My colleague who helps me with the colloquium, Paul Gilmore, is in the back here. Uh, running the video camera. Paul teaches history here at Fresno City College. Uh, tonight is a pretty special colloquium, as I will be explaining in a minute. Um, and because it's so special, and because our guest is very special, uh, we have invited uh, the Vice President of, of Instruction, Don Lopez, to welcome our guest to our faculty. So Don, if you would come and do that now. Thank you. So I have the honor this evening of uh, introducing uh, Barton Ehrman, who is the uh, James A. Craig Distinguished Professor of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he's taught since 1988. I had a whole bunch of stuff I was going to say, <laughs> but I think Wendell's going to take care of all of that. So <laughs> I'd like you to join me in welcoming Barton Ehrman to President City College. <laughs> I know that he's a busy man. I wouldn't want his job because, uh, uh, as being the president, um, being the vice president of instruction is an impossible job. Uh, I currently sit on the search committee to hire a new president of President City College. Some of you might know that the uh, current president is an interim president. And they went around the room uh, when we started the committee asking us what we were looking for. And I said, I'm looking for somebody who can do the impossible. <laughs> because the job is impossible, right? And they translated that to we're looking for somebody who can walk on water, <laughs> which is highly appropriate to tonight. <laughs> right? And <clears throat> what I want to do is actually uh, not introduce uh, Dr. Ehrman, uh, but actually to introduce you to the campus community colloquium. Um, I think it's somewhat unique. It may be, it may be downright. Uh, the only thing that's absolutely unique in the community college system in California, I haven't tried to check. Um, but uh, as you know, a community college is not a research institution. Uh, uh, instructors here don't get paid to do research. They don't pay to publish books. Um, they don't get paid to publish scholarly articles. That's what people at the UCs do. Um, and, and to some degree, FCSUs. Right? Uh, community colleges are not set up to do that, and therefore, um, sometimes uh, community colleges uh, do not uh, pay a whole lot of attention to the latest research uh, in various fields. And they don't necessarily talk uh, to each other about uh, research in various fields. Well, uh, many of my colleagues here feel that that is um, not, not, a, not, a, not a very good view for community colleges to have that we should be involved actively in the intellectual life of the culture and uh, in our respective disciplines, uh, if not as much as uh, people doing research are, at least uh, to a significant extent. So some years ago, a colleague of mine and I started what we've been called the cross-campus colloquium. And the whole idea of the cross-campus colloquium was to involve faculty uh, in talking to each other about the latest thinking they were doing, the latest research they were doing, the latest project they had completed. And that was a wonderful, <clears throat> um, that was a wonderful uh, activity that we had. We had lots of colleagues come forward and present the latest research that they've been doing. And a lot of research is going on at the community college, it turns out. Uh, well, uh, a lot of people heard about it and they said, can I get in on that? You know, our students heard about it, and they said, can students come? And the idea was, well, it was just kind of for faculty, you know, to talk to faculty about uh, the ideas they were having. But after a while, we kind of started to get guilty. You know, <laughs> students would profit from this. Uh, why not allow students to come in? And so we decided, all right, we will uh, ask students to come, we'll invite them. Uh, and then uh, we soon had the thought, well, why not invite the whole community? Why just uh, 
Fresno City College community and the students and faculty and staff there. Why not the whole community? So finally we say, all right, let's make it the campus community colloquium, right? And for about the last five years, I think, we have been inviting people from outside the campus to come and participate in the uh, usually panel discussions is what we have. Those of you who've been to a colloquium before know that we typically have a panel of three or four folks. Uh, and we ask them to come to address a particular issue from a particular point of view. <clears throat> um, and we've had a number of issues that we've discussed over the years, uh, way too many to mention. I just want to give you a flavor of some of them, though. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we've discussed issues uh, such as three strikes and you're out. I wonder if anybody knows in here, some people probably do know, that one of the authors of the Three Strikes Law in California lives right here in Fresno. And so I see some people shaking their heads, they do that. Well, that person came to our colloquium and was one of our panels on that panel. <coughs> Three Strikes Law, uh, of course, is uh, quite a controversial law. And since we had that panel, it actually has been repealed by the voters. But that was one of our topics. Uh, the relevance of the Fourth and Fifth Amendments to contemporary issues. Uh, guns and gun laws. <clears throat> what to do about downtown Fresno. Uh, drugs and drug laws. The role of international law in war and peace. Homosexuality and gay marriage. Uh, the significance of the attacks on Charlie Hebdo in Paris, which we did in conjunction with something else Paul says here in Fresno. <clears throat> Climate change and many other issues, far too numerous to mention. You will notice that most of those issues are controversial, right? Guns, uh, homosexuality, gay marriage, uh, certainly has been controversial. Uh, you might think, well, then the colloquium is all about debates. But you'd be wrong, it's not. From the very beginning, we were against the idea of a debate. Why? Because we want to throw light on issues of public importance. And we felt, and I feel, that debates too often just generate heat. They don't generate light. So we wanted to generate light, and so we don't structure our colloquia in terms of debates. And that includes tonight's colloquia. It's not a debate. However, we have always, from the very beginning, encouraged questions from the audience and from the panel members to each other. <coughs> Uh, critical questions, if you want. Probing questions, if you want. Um, that's part of what we think helps throw light on issues. Right? So tonight, for example, I'm going to be asking Dr. Ehrman some questions uh, that occurred to me when I read through his wonderful new book, <coughs> uh, How Jesus Became God, and um, he's going to answer those questions. After I do that, we're going to throw it open, as we always do, to you, the audience members, to ask your questions. And we always try to allow a lot of time for audience questions because I learned a long time ago that these kinds of things, the kind of people who are likely to show up are the kind of people who, who typically enjoy asking questions more than they enjoy listening to the answers. <laughs> <laughs> and often, uh, there are people who think they have better answers to the questions they ask than the people to whom they ask the questions. Right? Uh, and uh, I welcome that. We welcome that. And that's what we've always been about uh, in these colloquiums. Okay, so uh, having said all that, I hope you think, well, that's a really good idea, Wendell. I'm glad that you and your colleagues have formed that and uh, made this sort of thing possible. Uh, and I'm glad that this is entirely free. And I didn't have to buy a ticket. I had some people email me saying, well, do I have to buy a ticket? Uh, and I said, no, entirely free. Uh, Fresno City College gives us the use of the facilities entirely free. Um, we have frequently we meet in an even nicer building than this, all uh, free from Fresno City College. Uh, and so I would like to thank Fresno City College for supporting these colloquia. Um, many of our colleagues support us with donations, which we need, and that's what I'm uh, leading to now. Um, these things are free because people donate to make them possible, right? We bring in speakers sometimes, and sometimes we have to pay them, right? Um, and where do we get the money? We get the money from people who are willing to donate. 
My colleague has written uh, his email, my email, and my colleague who's one of our organizers on the board. Um, if you would like to donate, it's a 501c3. We have a, a foundation account here. Um, please send us an email and say, I'm looking to donate $25, $50, whatever it may be. That makes uh, well, if we like this one possible, and it makes many others possible uh, where we want to um, call in speakers um, that um, require a um, fee or um, travel expenses or whatever. Okay, so that's my plug, and I hope you will uh, see it in your heart to do that. Uh, now, I'm simply going to turn it over for a few minutes to Dr. Ehrman. I asked him to essentially introduce himself and tell us a little bit about you know, why he's involved in the work he's in, uh, about five minutes or so, and then I will ask him some questions. So, Dr. Ehrman. about it and about what my, uh, my ideas about this are without repeating everything for this morning, but also uh, for those of you who weren't there this morning to kind of let you in on what the point of the book is. So um, I, I, for a long time, have been interested in the question of how uh, early Christians understood Jesus. Uh, and I'm interested in this, not, I'm not interested in it for personal theological reasons. Uh, in other words, it's, it's not that I'm a theologian and I'm trying to understand the theology that I have. Uh, I'm approaching this question from a, from a historical perspective rather than a theological perspective. So I'm not assuming that Jesus is God and I'm not assuming that Jesus is not God. I'm bracketing that question and it's not the question I'm asking. I'm asking, how is it the Christians started calling Jesus God and when did they start calling him God? And what do they mean by it when they called him God? So as it turns out, if you say Jesus is God, you can mean a lot of different things. You might think it's only one thing, but in fact, it can mean a lot of different things. And one of my arguments in this book is that whenever you see somebody in early Christianity saying that Jesus is God, then you have to ask, well, in what sense do they mean that? Um, one thing I did talk about this morning that is uh, fairly key to my book is that uh, I am absolutely convinced that during his lifetime, Jesus did not call himself God, or teach that he was God, or think that he was God. Uh, he might have thought it. There's no way to know what he was thinking uh, any more than you can know what I'm thinking right now. <laughs> and I can tell you, you do not know what I'm thinking right now. Are you about fear? I told you you didn't know. So, uh, we didn't. Uh, so uh, right, so uh, it is true that in the New Testament, in one of our Gospels, Jesus does uh, talk about himself as a divine being. It's in our last Gospel, the Gospel of John. Uh, so the Gospels, the, the Gospels were not the earliest books of the New Testament to be written. Uh, the earliest writings were the Apostle Paul. The first Gospel we have is probably the Gospel of Mark, as I was saying this morning. The Gospel of Mark was probably written around the year 70 CE, so AD 70. Uh, so that's about 40 years after Jesus' death. Matthew and Luke were written about 10 or 15 years after Mark, and the Gospel of John was probably written about 10 or 15 years after that. So the Gospel of John is written around the year 90 or 95. Scholars have different opinions, but it's usually put around there sometime. In the Gospel of John, Jesus absolutely talks about himself as a divine being. Uh, Jesus says things like, uh, before Abraham was, I am. So, <laughs> right, you know anything about like the Bible? Abraham was the father of the Jews who was living 1,800 years earlier. 
And Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. And uh, when he says, I am, he's actually using the name that God gives himself in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses is talking to God, and he says, they're going to ask me what your name is. What's your name? And God says, I am. <laughs> Tell them that I am sent you. Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. Well, his Jewish opponents know exactly what he's saying. They pick up stones to stone him to death for blasphemy. This is only, this is in the Gospel of John. Uh, a few chapters, a couple chapters later, John chapter 10, Jesus says, the Father and I are one. Wow, okay. They pick up the stones again. Uh, later, four chapters later, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says to them, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. So, Peter, these are really exalted claims. My question that I have in my book is not whether Jesus calls himself God in any of the Gospels. My question is, did the man Jesus himself, the historical man who's actually lived, did he call himself God? Not whether somebody writing 60 years later claimed that he called himself God, but did he actually call himself God? And I, I make a kind of an extended argument in the book that, in fact, the historical Jesus did not call himself God. Uh, I am completely convinced by this, and for a number of reasons. But one reason is this. If, if Jesus was calling himself God, that would, yeah, that would be blasphemous uh, in the eyes of Jews at the time. Uh, it would be an astounding thing to say. Uh, Sane people do not go around calling themselves God. This would be the most important thing that he would have said. This would be of cataclysmic importance. If that's the case, why is it that the three earlier Gospels don't say a word about it? Like, they just forgot to mention that part? It would be like the most important thing to say. So, I don't think they knew. They had no idea that Jesus said something like that. I think that, in fact, what's going on is that by the time you get to the Gospel of John, the community out of which this author was writing this Gospel, that community believed that Jesus was God, and if he believed he was God, he must have said he was God. And so they put the words on his lips. That's my argument. In Je during Jesus' lifetime, uh, I don't think he thought he was, uh, he didn't call himself God. And it's certainly the case that none of the disciples understood him to call himself, to call himself God during his lifetime. Even the Gospels agree about that. The disciples didn't think he was God. They, just, they were trying to figure out how he, could be the, how he could be God's Messiah if he got crucified. They weren't worried about whether he was God. They weren't even thinking about that. They were wondering how a Messiah could get crucified. Um, so... What I argue today in my lecture is that even though during his lifetime people were not calling him God, after his death, they were calling him God. Some people were. And what I argued in the lecture is that the reason people came to think that Jesus was God, came to believe he was God, is because they came to believe that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Now, I'm not saying he was raised from the dead. I'm not saying he was not raised from the dead. I'm saying the reason they started calling him God is because they believed he was raised from the dead. If you're a Christian, you would say it's because he was raised from the dead. If you're not a Christian, you'd say, well, it's just because that's what they thought. Uh, but, but either way, that's what led people to call him God. And the, the logic I laid out today, just to repeat uh, for those of you who are there, is that in the ancient world, there were stories of a number of individuals who were taken up to heaven at their death. And those individuals were taken up to heaven to live in the realm of God or the gods, those people were thought to have been made divine beings. So uh, there are a number of examples of this in Greek and Roman mythology, uh, examples of this in Judaism, where people taken up to heaven are thought to become divine beings. Well, the disciples of Jesus who thought he got raised from the dead, they knew that if he was raised from the dead, he's, he's not here any longer. Where is he? Well, if he's been raised from the dead, why isn't he living with us now? He's not living with us because he's been taken up to heaven. And what happens when somebody's taken up to heaven? They're made a divine being. And so they started thinking of Jesus as a divine being. Once they started thinking that, it started a thought process that lasted several centuries. 
about 300 years later, Christians were not saying simply that God had made Jesus a divine being. They, they were saying at that point, 300 years later, they were saying, Christ had always been a divine being. He existed before he came into the world. He was God himself. He was equal with God the Father. He was of the same essence as God the Father. He had always existed. He created the universe. They were saying that about Jesus uh, as the one who had, uh, had become the second member of the Trinity. Uh, and so that's a long development, and that's, that's what my book is about, is uh, about all that. So, anyway, uh, that, that's enough of an introduction. Uh, I will now enter into cross-examination. <laughs> yeah, right, it's not a date. Um, um, I uh, commend the book to you. It's uh, very, very interesting, very, uh, very intriguing, and uh, lots of questions are generated by it, and that's uh, where my questions come from. I also would like to mention uh, that uh, Dr. Irvin is the author of a very fine uh, introduction to the New Testament, uh, historical introduction to the early Christian writings. It's gone to its sixth edition, he tells me now, uh, with Oxford University Press. And it, uh, if you want to know uh, a lot more about the New Testament than you ever thought possible, uh, then you want to read uh, the latest edition of his book. Okay, so uh, I wrote out some questions, and I remind you that I identify myself as a philosophy instructor here, right? Uh, I'm not a New Testament scholar. I'm not a historian. Um, Paul's a historian, but he's not a historian of early Christianity. So I'm not asking him questions from the point of view of a historian or from the point of view of a, uh, a New Testament scholar, but really more from a philosophical point of view, although some of my questions are um, asking him a bit about his view as a historian. Indeed, that's what my first one is about. So, um, Dr. Ehrman, uh, you've written a book in, that you, in which you argue that Jesus did in fact exist as a historical figure. I think this gentleman over here has that book, as a matter of fact. Oh, he's the one. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, you well know, and some people in this room may know, that there have been scholars who argued that Jesus did not in fact exist at all. Jesus was a myth. I think G.A. Wells may be the best known uh, person uh, who's uh, adopted that view and argued for that view, and it has a variety of books. But in this book, uh, you argue that uh, Jesus did in fact exist. He, he existed in the same century as Caesar existed. There's, there's absolutely no doubt uh, that he existed, that he was a real person. Um, and, uh, you then say in, in this book um, that, at least as far as historians are concerned, um, he was no more than an apoc apocalyptic prophet who predicted that the end of the age was soon to arrive uh, when God would intervene in history and overthrow the forces of evil to bring in his good kingdom. In other words, he was something like Donald Trump, uh, but he needed God's intervention. He couldn't do it all himself. <clears throat> uh, what are the good reasons for holding that Jesus did in fact exist as a historical person and that he was merely an apocalyptic prophet who made false predictions about the end of the age. Uh, right. So, uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the first question is the book I wrote, and the second question is another book I wrote. So let me do this in, <laughs> let, let me do this in two minutes. <laughs> right. right. Uh, okay. So, uh, I don't think there's any doubt that Jesus existed. It, there, are, there are a couple of scholars who've argued he didn't exist. There, there are a lot of voices out there saying that he didn't exist, but they're not, they're not by scholars who are actually trained in any historical disciplines. Uh, there are voices on the internet, but you know, there are voices on the internet for all sorts of things. So, um, uh, scholars who study this stuff, really, uh, there isn't any. It's not, a, it's not a question that's debated among my colleagues. It is not debated uh, because the evidence is so overwhelming. Um, the, the specific evidence is a little bit hard to explain in two minutes, so maybe I'm not even going to do that. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one argument. I'll give you one argument that is like, you, know, you have to understand, like, this isn't like the only argument. Let me give you one argument. Um, the, the people who are called mythicists argue that Jesus was invented, that he's a myth that was made up, that there never was an actual man, Jesus. Uh, here's one reason for thinking that's wrong. The early Christians, whether or not Jesus existed, the early Christians said that Jesus was the Messiah. And they said 
he was crucified. That would be a nonsensical statement for people in antiquity that the Messiah got crucified. The Messiah was not supposed to suffer and die. Now Christians today uh, typically say, you know, they talk about the suffering Messiah, that uh, you have the prediction of the suffering Messiah in the Old Testament. If you actually read the Old Testament, there is no passage in the Old Testament that talks about the Messiah that says anything about the Messiah suffering. There are passages in the Old Testament that talk about somebody suffering, but they are never talking about the Messiah. There are other passages that talk about the Messiah, and they don't talk about the Messiah suffering. These were two incommensurate categories, because the Messiah was supposed to be the great king of Israel who overthrew the enemy and set up God's kingdom in Jerusalem. He was to be the great political, military leader of the Jews who destroyed the enemy. That's what the Messiah was expected to be. So, if you're going to invent a Jesus who's the Messiah in, uh, in fulfillment of expectation, what would that person be like? He'd be the king in Jerusalem. But they didn't invent that Jesus. They didn't Allegedly, they invented a Jesus who got crucified, a Christ who got crucified. But nobody expected a Christ to be crucified. So if you're inventing somebody in order to meet some kind of a public demand for a Messiah figure, instead of Messiah who's the great political military leader, you've invented somebody who is squashed by the enemy, who's tortured to death. That it was such a problematic category that most Jews absolutely rejected it as a ludicrous idea. So why would you invent a ludicrous idea if you wanted to convince people? Wouldn't you invent an idea that made sense to people? Well, why didn't they invent the idea that Jesus was a Messiah who was the king in Jerusalem? Because everybody knew he wasn't a king in Jerusalem. There's no Jesus who's the king in Jerusalem. Why did they invent the idea of a Messiah who who got crucified? Because they knew that Jesus got crucified. They, they thought he was the Messiah, and the big task for them was to explain, how can he be the Messiah if he got crucified? And so they have to explain that, and Paul, the Apostle Paul, our first author, says it's the major stumbling block for the Jews that the Messiah got crucified. All right, why do I think that Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet? In uh, the first century, there were a lot of Jews who held to views that scholars have called apocalyptic. Uh, these are apocalyptic views because they, uh, they, they maintain, the, the, the word apocalyptic comes from the Greek word apocalypsis, or Greek word apocalypse. Uh, apocalypse means a revealing or an unveiling. These, these Jewish thinkers thought that God had revealed to them the secrets that made sense of life here on earth. The, the heavenly secrets that make sense of earthly realities. Specifically, Jewish apocalypticists were trying to explain why there could be so much pain, misery, and suffering here on earth if God's in control. I mean, it doesn't look like God's in control. Earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, tornadoes, birth defects, war, famine, plague. You mean God's in control? Well, what's the evidence of that? So, apocalypticists have an answer. There are forces of evil who are in control of this world, who are causing all of this pain and suffering. They are opposed to God. But God is soon going to intervene to overthrow the forces of evil and set up a good kingdom on earth. It's going to happen very soon. God is very soon going to intervene to destroy history as we know it and start over again with the new heavens and the new earth. He will bring in a good kingdom where there will be no more pain, misery, or suffering. The kingdom of God. How soon will it be? Truly I tell you, some of you standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come in power. Words of Jesus, Mark chapter 9, verse 1. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away before all these things take place. Mark 13, 30, the words of Jesus. 
So I argue uh, in one of my earlier books that Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet predicting that the end of the age was going to come within his generation, and that as such, he was very much like other Jewish preachers of his day, because Jewish apocalyptic thought was widespread. We have a number of indications of Jewish apocalyptic thought in his day, including the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were written by a community of apocalyptic Jews living at about the same time and about the same place as Jesus. And these apocalyptic preachings of Jesus are found throughout our earliest sources. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, filled with these kinds of apocalyptic pre predictions. And so uh, scholars, for over a century now, the, the majority opinion among the critical scholars has been that Jesus was an apocalyptic problem. Sorry, that was longer than two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, the part of your book that most surprised me was the part where you argue that it's quite unlikely that Jesus was given a decent burial and quite unlikely that he was laid in a tomb and that the tomb was found empty by certain women three days after he died and was buried. You don't deny that he was crucified by the Romans by order of Pilate and that he did indeed die. So why wouldn't there be a tomb and why isn't the story that it was found to be empty by certain women a likely story? Yeah, great question. And it's... This is another complicated one that's going to be hard to, to deal with. Officers always ask complicated <laughs> So, uh, right, this is probably the most controversial part of my book, uh, but I, I, I developed the argument there, so if you really, if you really want to see the argument, just read the book. Um, but here's the deal. Uh, I, uh, years ago, I heard of a New Testament scholar, a guy named John Donovan Cross, who argued that Jesus was not given a decent burial. In the New Testament, Jesus is given a decent burial. When Jesus dies, a man named Joseph of Arimathea asks Pontius Pilate, the governor, for the body of Jesus. Pilate gives him the body, and that afternoon he buries him so that he'll be buried before the Sabbath comes. It's on a Friday afternoon, so he has to bury him before he gets dark on Friday. And so he's given a decent burial in Joseph's tomb. And then uh, on the, the third day, on the Sunday following, the women go to the tomb, the tomb's empty, and Jesus has been raised. But I, uh, th this fellow, John Donald Crossan, argued that Jesus wasn't given a decent burial despite these traditions in the gospel. And when I read this, I thought it was crazy. Uh, I thought, man, this guy, he's just trying, he's like, he's, he's looking for publicity or something, because... Crossan actually argued that Jesus' body was eaten by dogs. Oh, come on. <laughs> Give me a break. So, all right, so that was years ago. So I started doing my research on this book, and I thought, you know, I would be interested in knowing what did Romans normally do with crucified people? What was the normal Roman procedure about burial? And so I looked up every reference in every Greek and Roman source from antiquity that I could find that dealt with the question about crucifixion. And what I found, to my surprise, is that Romans had a clear policy about what to do about crucified victims. They did not allow decent burials. The reason was this. Crucifixion was reserved for uh, slaves and for low lives who had committed horrible crimes. The Romans had a very different view of crime and punishment uh, from the view that we have, most of us have in America today. Uh, many people today, of course, don't believe in capital punishment at all. Uh, those who do believe in capital punishment believe that a death sentence should be, uh, should be carried out in private and it should be made as painless as possible. Uh, part of the big dispute these days, of course, is that uh, these methods of execution that are being used are not as painless as they're supposed to be. But the logic behind them is, it's supposed to be painless and private. The Romans had an opposite idea. Their view was, you make it public, and you make it as painful as you could possibly make it. You torture people to death publicly. You hang them on crosses, where they'll hang for several days, usually, before they die. And they'll be in deep agony, screaming the whole time. You do that in a public place. You do it in the public square. Uh, that would be a disincentive for crime. <laughs> so uh, you're a slave. Uh, you've murdered your master. OK. We're going to crucify.
crucify you, and we're going to see how many more slaves want to want to kill their masters. Uh, so you do it publicly. So part of the part of the um, part of the humiliation, though, and part of the punishment was disallowing burial. They left the bodies on the crosses to uh, to decompose on the crosses, and to be subject to the scavengers, especially birds. Uh, because this is to be a public display. If you're going to cross the power of Rome, this is what's going to happen to you. So, what would happen if Jesus was crucified and somebody who we don't have any evidence for existing, Joseph of Arimathea does not exist anywhere else in any source. We don't know of him outside of the Gospels. But suppose somebody you know, went up to Pilate and kindly asked him, let me have the body. Would Pilate say, yeah, sure, take the body? I don't think so. I don't think so. Pilate would have said, no, you don't get the body. He got crucified. He's going to stay on the cross. I think Jesus' body was left on the cross for a few days. And probably then it was tossed into some kind of uh, <coughs> common tomb, a common grave, uh, which is typically what happened. So I don't think there was, I don't think there was a, um, I don't think that there was an empty tomb, because I don't think there was a tomb. I think the story was made up later by Christians who wanted to say, Jesus is really a race. See, there's an empty tomb. Let me say, though, that in the New Testament, I'm not denying that Jesus got raised from the dead. I can see some of you are thinking, I'm denying that Jesus got raised. I'm not denying that Jesus got raised from the dead. I have Christian friends who are scholars, scholar friends who are Christians, they're one and the same, uh, Christian scholar friends who, who agree with me that Jesus wasn't given to common burial. They still think he got raised from the dead. It's just the empty tomb story isn't, isn't authentic. In the New Testament, when you get this empty tomb story, by the way, the empty tomb never leads anybody to believe that Jesus got raised from the dead. Because, as I was saying today, if you put somebody in a tomb, and you go back on the third day and the body's not in the tomb, you don't think raised from the dead. You think grave robbers. So the empty tomb wouldn't convince anybody. Uh, and it doesn't in the, in the New Testament. But I, don't, I personally don't think there was an empty tomb. Thanks very much. That leads uh, directly into the next question. Uh, because you just said, well, it wasn't the empty tomb that uh, convinced the disciples um, that Jesus had risen from the dead. So that leads to the question, what did? And in, the, in your book, you argue that the evidence is unambiguous and compelling that at least some of Jesus' disciples claimed that they saw him alive after he had died. And you allow that they had visions of Jesus alive and well, even though they had no doubt that he had really died. So let's grant all this. Here's a big question, I think. Assuming these disciples were otherwise sane and rational, as I believe you assume, how could they seriously think that they had seen Jesus alive and well after he had died if he had not in fact come back from the dead? To put this question another way, isn't it just first-class compelling evidence that Jesus was in fact resurrected that otherwise sane and rational people who did not expect him to be alive or to see him again saw him alive and thereby came to believe that he indeed was alive. Uh, yeah, no, it could be taken as evidence that Jesus came back from the dead, absolutely. Um, I sometimes have uh, public debates with conservative evangelical scholars on the question of whether historians can prove that Jesus was raised from the dead. These, these conservative evangelicals think both that it can be proven and that they can prove it. My view is they can't prove it because it cannot be proven. Uh, I don't think that historians can prove. And so they say, yes, but you have these visions of Jesus, and uh, sane and sober people with visions must, must they be, you know, unless they're crazy, uh, you know, they, they wouldn't be having these visions. Uh, and then, moreover, they say, to compound the issue, they say, in the New Testament, there are groups of people who see Jesus. And so you can imagine somebody having a hallucination, but how can you have a group hallucination? Okay, so that, on the surface, that sounds like a compelling argument. But there's a good counter-argument to that. These are conservative, Protestant, evangelical Christians. I point out to them that we have thoroughly documented instances of modern-day 
sane and sober people in large groups seeing the Blessed Virgin Mary appear to them. These debate partners of mine don't believe that Mary really appears to people, which means, by definition, they think there are group hallucinations. They think there are group hallucinations, so I don't have to argue with it because they think so. So the question is, can sane and sober people have visions? The answer is absolutely yes, it happens all the time. I pointed out this morning that one out of eight of us will have had or will have a vision of a deceased loved one. There is firm psychological research on hallucinations. Um, so your, uh, your grandmother dies, and a week later, you see her in your bedroom, clear as day. You, uh, a, a child reappears to you, a parent reappears to you, a good friend appears to you. One out of eight of us will have these visions. Um, and, you know, you could say, well, they're, they actually happen, which is fine, but, you know, most of the time they're probably not... They probably don't happen. It's something that, that you experience. There are psychological reasons for you having these, these experiences. The experiences, the visionary experiences that people have today, sane and sober people have today, are generally two types. They're either deceased loved ones or they're religious figures who appear to them, such as the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, so uh, Jesus is both. For his disciples, he was a deceased loved one, and he's a revered religious person. So there's nothing implausible at all about disciples having visions of him. If you're a Christian, what you say is they had visions of him because Jesus really appeared to them. If you're a non-Christian, you say it's because they had hallucinations. Either way, it works. Because on the basis of those visions, whether, uh, whether they really were Jesus or not, uh, on the base of those visions, they started thinking that Jesus was raised from the dead. Thank you. Uh, the next question um, goes to a puzzle I had pretty much as I finished the book. So I'm hoping, uh, and this is a question that I'm wondering if you've ever been asked. Um, I think at some point in your book, you, you talk about a pastor. Um, I can't remember who exactly it was now. Um, and I think you were saying uh, that you were losing your faith or you were having doubts or something. And he said, well, what you need to remember is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I don't know if you remember that, that uh, anecdote that you mentioned in your book. And that and a couple other things, as I read the book, made me wonder, what, what really is the significance of believing that Jesus is God? I mean... The, the statement that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life is not a statement that Jesus is God. <clears throat> it might be taken to be a statement that, look, he's the sacrifice that God accepts, and um, uh, the only sacrifice he accepts, and he's the way. Maybe all this stuff about Jesus being God that the Christians eventually develop, that you argue they develop, maybe that's just irrelevant. It's just all theology that maybe they should never have developed. And if they had not, maybe things wouldn't be any different. I mean, well, maybe what's critical is that people have this belief that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Right. Uh, okay, so um, I think there are two, there, there are two <coughs> ways of dealing with that question. One is the theological, one is the historical. So let me just say the theological way, even though I'm not a theologian. Um, I... Um, his, in terms of the history of theology, the issue of whether Jesus was God or not was important theologically uh, because Christian theologians developed the idea that um, that Christ, for, for Christ's death to be satisfying to God, he himself had to be divine in some sense. That God required a divine sacrifice for sins. So, if Christ, if Christ wasn't human, then he couldn't die for human sins and appease God. But if he's not God, then, then his death is just the death of a human. 
And if I die for you, uh, you know, if I die and say, well, it's for you, I mean, it doesn't do any good. It's just my, me dying. It has to be something other than that. It has to be actually uh, something far more significant, which is the death of God himself. Uh, and so that's the, theologians have argued that. So I'm not a theologian. I'm a historian. So why does it matter historically? The reason it matters historically is if Christians did not say Jesus was God, if they said that he's just a human being who died, then his death would be the death like any other human death. I mean, it'd be unfortunate. Uh, it'd probably be undeserved. Uh, he'd be a prophet who got killed. There were lots of prophets who got killed, but you didn't start religions on them. If Christ had not been thought of as God, what we consider to be Christianity would never have started. If Christianity had not started, we would not have the history of Western civilization that happened. We wouldn't have the Middle Ages. We wouldn't have the Renaissance. We wouldn't have the Reformation. We wouldn't have modernity as we know it if Christians had not called Jesus God. So we would have had something, but among other things, we'd all still be pagans. As opposed to just a few of us. <laughs> so uh, we, we, we'd be worshiping Zeus uh, instead of uh, instead of God. So, so historically, I think it's enormously important. Uh, could there have been a Christianity that developed without Jesus being God? The answer to that is actually yes, to the extent that there were uh, there were Jewish Christians in early Christianity who thought that Christ was a human sacrifice, but not a divine sacrifice. That you never would have convinced Gentiles, in my opinion. Never would have convinced non-Jews. If Jesus was just a Jewish prophet who died, they'd say, well, that was a Jewish thing. You know, so you never would have had Christianity as well. <clears throat> uh, that, I think, uh, raises lots, lots of other questions that people might want to take up uh, afterwards. One of the reasons why I'm asking some questions is to sort of uh, prime the, prime the uh, what did we say, prime the, uh, the pump, right? Um, so I've got a couple others, but I think I'm going to defer those two to my last one, which is kind of a philosophical, theological one, but I'm interested in your thinking about it. Um, so what Christians eventually declare to be orthodox right belief about Jesus and God strikes many people who hear of it and think about it as paradoxical and extreme, indeed downright contradictory. You get some hint of the paradox when you write in your book uh, of those who were concerned to maintain that, quote, Jesus was God, Jesus was not God the Father, yet there is only one God. Have you guys got that? <laughs> something that he, that he writes in the book. Uh, Jesus was God, Jesus was not God the Father, yet there is only one God. I hope that sounds at least a little bit paradoxical to you, right? Uh, but that's not nearly as paradoxical as what Christians eventually develop. The whole panoply of Orthodox Christian beliefs about Jesus and God are much more paradoxical than that. And your book maybe is not really about this, but they include that Jesus was both God and a human being. In the same sense that human being, apparently, that applies to you and me, if you have written on this. Uh, they affirm that Jesus was killed. Doesn't it follow that God was killed? If Jesus and God are the same, and Jesus, and Jesus is killed, then God is killed? But God is immortal, and invulnerable to death and destruction. That's something Christians believe. Uh, so, if Jesus was human, it would seem to be undeniably true that he was limited in various ways. He was limited in knowledge, he was limited in power, and so on. Yet, Christians believe God has no limits. So, God had limits, and God did not have limits. You see how paradoxical it is? Much more paradoxical uh, than it may seem if you just stay with the quotes. God did die, and God cannot die, right? I, when I teach, my, I teach my students, do you think God can die? No, God can't die, right? Do you think God is limited in some way? No, God's not limited. Do you think Jesus was God? Yeah. Do you think Jesus was a 
human? Yeah. Are humans limited? Yeah. Can I do anything? Because, you know, can I do anything I want to do as a human? No. You see the problems here? Right? So here's my question. It's far from clear that any sane and rational person can even understand any of this, let alone believe it. It requires, as Kierkegaard said, a crucifixion of reason, or it appears to. Indeed, Kierkegaard celebrated that. Anybody read Kierkegaard? Um, this is the great thing about Christianity, right? It demands this incredible uh, sacrifice of human reason, right? It's an act of will. It's the best act of will you could possibly engage in, right? Um, so how have Christians attempted to deal with this criticism in the past? Is there any way to explain the resonance, the staying power, of some explanations about all this over others? I suppose another question here is, how does Christianity survive these problems that they seem to have created for themselves? Well, what, what theologians would say is that Christianity doesn't try to explain these problems. It's precisely theology that has, that has uh, elucidated them. Um, so that uh, this isn't a criticism from the outside. This is what Christians have developed, the, these paradoxical views. So uh, several things to say. One thing is the mistake is to say that Jesus is the same as God. In Christian theology, God the Son and God the Father are not the same. They're not identical. They're equal. Two things can be equal without being identical. And so, the issue has to do with the identity of Christ vis-a-vis -vis God the Father. So there are two issues. One is a Christological issue and one is a theological issue. By Christological, I mean the understanding of Jesus. And, and it is, it's a huge, hugely paradoxical, but theologians have always recognized this and, and in fact celebrated the paradox. So, um, you know, just as Kierkegaard, uh, Kierkegaard absolutely uh, recognized the paradox, but he celebrated it. It didn't, it didn't drive him away from, from faith. Um, and I, I guess, you know, it might be clear to you by now, I'm not a person of faith myself. I'm not a Christian, so I'm not, I'm not trying to, like, advocate for Christianity here. But, but I don't think that this paradox in itself is a, it has to be a stumbling block for faith. So the Christological paradox is in Christian, uh, in the, the theology that developed in the 4th and 5th Christian centuries, uh, so, you know, centuries after Jesus' day. The theology that developed is that Christ is both human and divine, but it's not that he's, like, partially human and partially divine. It's not that he's 50% one and 50% the other. The paradox is, he's 100% human, and he's 100% divine. That's a paradox. So... Uh, how do you explain it? Well, theologians tried to explain it, and they came up with all sorts of explanations, none of which ended up being satisfactory. They ended up declaring it's simply a mystery. Now, the virtue of a theological mystery is that you can't understand it. And if you think you understand it, you misunderstand it. <laughs> and so, but the affirmation is that he's fully human and fully divine. Well, God can't suffer, right? Uh, no, God the Father can't suffer. God the Son can suffer. And if you say, no, he can't, and somebody says, why not? And you say, because God can't suffer, that's just arguing in a circle. Uh, God the Son can suffer. Uh, and he did suffer. That's the Christian teaching. Uh, so, again, I mean, you may not agree with that, but that, that is the Christian teaching. So, uh, so there's that. That's the Christological issue. The theological issue is, Christ is God. God is God. God the Father is God. And then you throw the Holy Spirit into the mix. This even makes it worse. Get oh, three. I left that out. Yeah. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is God. All three are God. They are different from each other, but there's only one God. So if Jesus is, if Christ is God, God the Father is God, the Spirit is God, you got three gods, right? No, we have one God. Okay, so there's only one of them, right? No, there are three of them. Well, there are three of them, and they're all God, right? and so you go around and around in circles, and once again, it's a mystery that you can't understand. People come up with all sorts of, of analogies to try and explain it, 
And all of these analogies were ended up declared, being declared heresies by orthodox thinkers. So, you know, the, the one I hear most often is, it's like H2O. You know, it can be liquid, it can be solid like ice, it can be a vapor, but it's all H2O, right? Yeah, but you know, if it's, if it's ice, then it's not vapor but at the same time. So it's not three ways of being H2O. These are three distinct beings, all of whom are God. So um, I think Christians have to uh, recognize that these are concepts that uh, cannot be understood and it, it, with, with our Western rational minds. But uh, my philosopher friend here may not like this. Uh, there are other ways of thinking besides post-enlightenment Western modes of thought. And uh, I think that, in fact, uh, I mean, I myself privilege post-enlightenment Western modes of thought. That's how I think. But uh, I have uh, I have friends, I, but I'll just tell you my, my best friend, I was with him last week. We were, we, I was in New Orleans last week having a debate on how Jesus became God at the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, <laughs> which is as it is a fundamentalist Southern Baptist Seminary. And I was having a debate with, with another person, and each of us were able to bring in a friend to back us up. And I brought in my friend named Dale Martin, who teaches at Yale University. He, he has the premier job of teaching New Testament in the country. Uh, he is like one of the leading scholars in the New Testament. And he agrees with everything I said in this book, he read this book, he agreed with everything in it, and if you ask him, is Jesus God, he would say yes. And if you ask him, do you believe in the Trinity, he would say yes. Do you believe that Christ is fully human and fully divine? Yes. This guy is a lot smarter than me. So it isn't about smarts. It's not about smarts. So um, I want to stress that because a lot of people uh, think that uh, my view is that if you're a Christian, you're stupid. Uh, you might be stupid. Uh, <laughs> you might be a Christian. But those two things are not necessarily coterminous. Uh, just uh, they're, they're different ways of thinking. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. That's, that's my goal. Thanks very much. I think that's enough to prime the uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they have to do with miracles. I think they're very good questions, and I think uh, I've got some problems with Mark there, but uh, we'll let those go. Um, so now it's your turn, and I'm going to be the moderator, um, and I'm going to give you a, as much chance uh, to ask a question or speak as you want. Uh, but I don't really want people getting up to make a statement. I want people asking questions and then listening for the answers, okay? Uh, still the right here. Yeah, I'll repeat the question in case everybody doesn't hear it. So, uh, you know, if it's a if it's an issue about, about Christ being both human and divine, you've got Moses talking to God, and so is God being imagined as being in some way anthropomorphic? And um, yeah, I think in the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Bible does often portray God as becoming human temporarily. Uh, you get it right off the bat in the Garden of Eden. Uh, God creates Adam and Eve, and they uh, they eat the fruit, and they go in hiding, uh, you know, and they uh, they make fig leaves for themselves, and they go in hiding. And, and it says that, uh, that, that God was walking through the garden in the cool of the evening, and he, s he says, Adam, where are you? Because he's walking through the garden in the cool of the evening? What is that? That's, that's God. Uh, God, is, God is portrayed often in, in a human way. If Moses speaks to God. It's, yeah, so, so this idea that a... What, what I do in this book, actually, the, the first thing I do in the book is to show that in Greek and Roman circles, it's perfectly possible for a human being also to be a divine being. And then I show it's also true in Judaism. In Judaism as well, there's a conception that divine beings can be human beings. Uh, and the way they do it in ancient texts, both Greek and, Ro Greek and Roman pagan texts and in Jewish texts, there are three ways that a, that a person can be both divine and human at the same time. 
Sometimes a God becomes human. As in, you know, God walking through the garden. And you get a the law in Greek Roman mythology. A God temporarily becomes human. Sometimes a human becomes a God. If a human is taken up to heaven, they're made a divine being. And sometimes a human is born to the union of a God and a mortal. So you get all this Greek and Roman mythology where, uh, where Zeus uh, decides that some gorgeous woman uh, is someone that he wants to have, and so he comes down in human shape to have sex with her. Uh, and then she gets pregnant. Uh, what, well, what's born as a result? Well, she's, she's a human, he's, he's a God. So what's born is a, is, a, is a divine human. And you get that in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 6. The sons of God looked down upon the daughters of men and saw that they were beautiful. They came down and they had sex with them. And the result were, were these offspring, they were these giants who used to roam the earth. So those are three ways you can be human and divine at the same time. It's in pagan thought, but it's also in Jewish thought. Uh, Jerry. <coughs> well, yeah, you've, uh, you brought up this thing about the Trinity. And I'm just curious, from a historical perspective, where did that idea come from? When, how did the Christians invent the Trinity? Yeah. When, when did that happen? What was the problem? Yeah. When did they invent the idea of the Trinity? So um, it happened at the end of the, the, the key moment was at the end of the second Christian century. So about 100 years after the Gospels, a little bit later then, around the year 200, around the year 200. Um, the first person to use the term Trinity that we know of was the uh, Latin theologian uh, Tertullian. And Tertullian was combating a particular view of how to understand that Christ could be God, God the Father could be God, the Holy Spirit could be God, and yet you know, how they can all be God but there's only one God. The view that he was attacking was a view that, uh, I was explaining this this morning I guess, it, it's, the, it, it's a view that scholars have called modalism. And it's the idea, modalism is the idea that God exists in three modes of existence. So just as at the same, one at the same time, I am, I'm the son to my father, and I'm the brother to my sister, and I'm the father to my daughter, but there's only one of me. There were Christians saying that God is like that. That there's only one God, but he's in three kinds of relationships. Sometimes he acts as father, sometimes as son, sometimes as spirit. And so it depends on how he's relating to people or to the universe. Uh, so th there's only one of them, and that's how there could be three but one, because he's in three modes of existence. Tertullian opposed that view. Uh, Tertullian said things like, you know, if, if you know, it just doesn't make any sense because sometimes Christ prays to God the Father. So he's not talking to himself. And so what they're they're separate beings. Um, and, it's, uh, and he says things like, you know, uh, he says, I can prove they're separate beings. I mean, in the scriptures, in the, in the Bible, it's God says to Jesus, you are my son, today I have begotten you. He says, if you think that God, you believe in this modalism stuff, then I want to see you find a scripture that says, uh, I am my own son, today I have begotten myself. You know, you know that isn't what you have to So Tertullian says, look, there are three distinct people. But... They're united in purpose. So they're united in every way conceivable, so there's only really one divine will, but there are three persons in it. And so three distinct people, but uh, only one God. So Tertullian started that idea. Um, and it got developed into different ways from the way Tertullian did, but that, that's where it started, in the opposition to Moses. <coughs> Uh, what, what Tertullian called these opponents, he didn't call them modalists, he called them patropassionists. So patropassionism is this fancy word that Tertullian made up, and it literally means the father suffers. Because he's saying, you're saying, it's all the same person, you're, just, you're saying that God the Father got crucified. And Tertullian thought that was ridiculous, so he made up this, this mocking term, they're father sufferers. <laughs> so, yeah. <coughs> yeah, no, here. I never had heard that, that that was 
an agreement there. And, and your argument with Conscious Pilot about well, the world is with climate. But from what I remember reading, I thought it was more sympathetic to Jesus. That it was more of the Jews that were saying, kill him, kill him, and he was kind of saying, are you sure this is what you want? Yeah. Yeah. And I can yeah. see it kind of happening. Yeah, yeah. You might want to repeat. Yeah, I'll repeat the whole thing. <laughs> I won't repeat the whole thing, but I'll repeat the essence. Right. So, um, she's asking about, um, she's saying that she didn't know that there was this agreement between Jews and Christians that there was no empty tomb. That was the first point. And actually, there's no agreement about that. Uh, most people disagree with me on that. So, uh, so this is this is one of my points. So, um, although, I think there's really good evidence for it. But, but anyway, so, uh, but then she was saying she thought that uh, she thought Pilate was sympathetic toward Jesus, so wouldn't that make him inclined to uh, to give the body over because he's he's more sympathetic and it's the Jews' fault Jesus got killed. Uh, so it's really interesting when you line the Gospels up uh, chronologically. So you put Mark first, and then you put Matthew, and then you put Luke, and then you put John, and then you put the non-canonical Gospels. You line them up chronologically, and you ask. How do they portray Pontius Pilate? In the earliest Gospel of Mark, Pilate is the governor, he's the governor of Judea and all of them, he's the governor, and he and the Jewish leaders kind of agree that Jesus deserves to die in, in Mark. When you get to Matthew, the next Gospel chronologically, Pilate doesn't want to kill Jesus, and the Jewish people insist on it, so he asks for water, and this is only in Matthew. He washes his hands and he says, I am innocent of this man's blood. And the Jewish crowd, not just the leaders, but the Jewish crowd cries out, his blood be upon us and our children. So this is this verse that was used for hateful anti-Semitic purposes over the centuries. By people saying, Jews are responsible and they pass the guilt for killing Christ onto their descendants. That's why you can persecute Jews today. It's the way it was used. So... So, uh, so now Pilate's more innocent. Uh, when you get to the Gospel of Luke, next, Pilate declares Jesus innocent three times. Three times he explicitly says that he's done nothing wrong. See, Pilate's getting more innocent. This, you get to the Gospel of John, the last Gospel. In the Gospel of John, you, you won't get this in most English translations because they play around with the wording. What it says in the Greek is that the scribes and the Pharisees were, uh, are accusing Jesus of many things. Uh, so uh, they insist that Pilate crucify him. And, and then it says, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. The Jewish leaders. Whoa! As you go on in time, Pilate becomes more and more innocent. When you get into the 2nd and 3rd, 4th century, you have Christians telling all sorts of stories about Pilate. In some Christian texts, Pilate converts to be a Christian. He writes, so the, the, the day, you know, soon after he does the crucifixion, he writes to the emperor, Tiberius, and he says, Ah, you won't believe what I did yesterday. I crucified the Son of God. We're in trouble. <laughs> and Tiberius gets all angry at him. He says, Why did you do that? You know that he's more powerful than our gods. And so he arrests Pilate. And Pilate, uh, uh, he sends Pilate to death, and Pilate prays to Christ, and Pilate becomes a Christian. Uh, Pilate? Pontius Pilate becomes a Christian? In one part of the church, the Ethiopian church, Pontius Pilate became canonized as a Christian saint. Pontius Pilate? What in the world is that all about? This is what it's all about. If Pontius Pilate is innocent, who's guilty? those damn Jews. And so the innocence of Pilate is actually, I think, a literary motif that is being developed in the context of, Jew of Christian anti-Judaism. And so my view is that Pilate wasn't innocent at all. I think Pilate's the one who decided to the cross. You're going to be a troublemaker. I'm going to go way back in the back, not to neglect people, way back in the back, yeah. Uh, I would recommend everybody just watch some of his debates on YouTube, and I, I just love getting both sides. I don't, you know, so I, I do appreciate you being here and, and sharing your, your thoughts here. Um, my question would be, what would, I guess two questions. You've talked about that John, you kind of loaded on John as far as being the one that 
you know, gave Jesus his divinity. But what about throughout the rest of the scriptures? I mean, I, I think that there's a lot of stuff in there, just off the top of my head, in the book of Matthew, where it says that, you know, Jesus is talking to uh, the high priest and he's about to, you know, get crucified. And he's talking about him coming on the on the clouds in judgment. He's called the Son of God multiple times, and, you know, Son of Man. You've got these Jehovah Jesus texts where the fulfillment of prophecy of the Old Testament is Jehovah in the Old Testament, is, and it's Jesus in the New Testament. You've got from the book of Hebrews calling Jesus God, the book of Revelation, John again. You've got uh, uh, Peter, um, you know, multiple yeah, times. You can actually stop here because I agree with you. I think all these texts agree that Jesus is God. So, okay, so why? That wasn't my point. My point was that the Gospel of John is the only Gospel where Jesus goes around making these divine claims for himself. That's, so, that was my point. Okay, so what, how do you know what Jesus said? Uh, what I'm arguing is that if Jesus really was going around calling himself God, that that's something that the other Gospels certainly would have mentioned. And so you're just in, you're just saying that they didn't like. I mean, what does the Son of God mean? What does that term mean? Uh, it means different things to different people. So in the Old Testament, the Son of God uh, is sometimes used for the King of Israel. Uh, and so Second Samuel chapter seven verses eleven to fourteen, where uh, David is talking to the prophet Nathan, and Nathan. Uh, speaking for God says that David will have a son, he'll always sit on the throne, and God says, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. And so in the Old Testament you get passages like Psalm 2, you are my beloved son, uh, in, today I have begotten you, referring to the king of Israel. So the king of Israel was God, who was the son of God. Uh, the nation of Israel is sometimes called the son of God. Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, Out of Egypt have I called my son. We're talking about the Exodus of the children of Israel. So sometimes Son of God is referring to the king. Sometimes referring to all of Israel. Sometimes Son of God is referring to angels. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, uh, the sons of God look down on the daughters of men and saw they were beautiful. So it could mean, it doesn't mean any one thing. I think it means it can mean a range of things. So you Thanks have for your question. Uh, May, may I ask just, re just real quick, how, how do we, no, sorry, what would it take to questions. become, right for to you to the, uh, decide? Yeah. <coughs> sorry, we'll have to go to a different question. Uh, can you explain uh, how Jesus understood the Son of Man figure and how that relates to the Apocalypse? <laughs> In 29 minutes or less? Probably not. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, what did Jesus think about the Son of Man? So, uh, I'm sorry I'm laughing. Y'all don't know why I'm laughing. I'm laughing because there are very thick books written on this by people who all disagree with each other. And it's like, it's really complicated. It's really complicated. It's much more complicated than the Son of God thing. Jesus talks about a figure that he calls the Son of Man in the New Testament. There are three categories of sayings of Jesus about the Son of Man. Sometimes when Jesus talks about the Son of Man, he talks about himself. Um, when he says things like, uh, you know, birds have nests and foxes have lairs, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So he's talking about himself. It's a self-reference. Sometimes, second category, sometimes these self-references that Jesus has are to his future, uh, or to his own future suffering. <coughs> The Son of Man must go to Jerusalem, be rejected by the scribes and elders, and uh, be crucified, and the third day he'll rise from the dead. So sometimes just self-references, sometimes references to his suffering. And the third category is sometimes Jesus talks about a figure called the Son of Man who's coming to judge the earth. Uh, Mark chapter 8, verse 38. Whosoever is whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of that one, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes on the clouds of heaven in the presence of the holy angels. All right, so that's a different category of Son of Man saints. And so the question that scholars have wrestled with for over 100 years is, did Jesus say all three sorts of things, or did he say one of the three, or two of the three? And, and how do you know? And so I'll tell you my opinion about it without being able to do, develop the argument very fully. Uh, but my, my view about this, um, which by the way is a view that I've, I've had 
for uh, 30 years. I had this view back when I was a Christian. I had this view. This is the view I had. This is my view. Um, my view is Jesus thought that there's going to be a cosmic judge of the earth who's coming back to bring in the kingdom that he called the Son of Man. And that the sayings that talk about this cosmic judge of the man judging the earth, there's nothing in those sayings that would make you think that Jesus was talking about himself unless you already thought Jesus was talking about himself. In other words, when he says, whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in the sinful and adulterous journey, of that one, he doesn't say of that one, I'll be ashamed when I come in the clouds of heaven. He says of that one, the Son of Man will be ashamed. So if you weren't already thinking that he's the Son of Man, you would you'd think he's differentiating himself. If you're ashamed of me, the cosmic judge of the earth is going to be ashamed of you. So the sayings in which Jesus appears to differentiate between himself and the Son of Man are these cosmic judge sayings. Okay? Now, the early Christians thought Jesus was the Son of Man. They thought Jesus had died, he's gone up to heaven, and they thought he's coming back. Jesus is coming back a second time, and this time he's not coming in humiliation or humility. He's coming in judgment. <coughs> judgment day is going to come when Jesus returns. That's what the early Christians thought. Christians thought he was the Son of Man. <coughs> so are they putting some of the Son of Man sayings on his lips? If they are, they would be the Son of Man sayings in which he identifies himself as the Son of Man because they thought he was the Son of Man. The ones they would not have put on his lips are the ones that appear to be differentiating himself from the Son of Man. That means those are the sayings that probably they would not have invented, and if they didn't invent them, where'd they come from? They'd be things Jesus really said. So, my view of the Son of Man sayings is that he thought that there's going to be a cosmic judge of the earth that he called the Son of Man. And it's based on, it's based on Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 to 14. So he's, he's actually referring to a scripture passage the book of Daniel talks about this one like a son of man who will be a future judge of the earth, and Jesus is referring to that when he talks about the son of man. That's my uh, Michelle. Yeah. Um, I want to preface my question by saying I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a historian, I'm a solo English teacher. So, <laughs> um, I probably have more patience with paradox and contradictions, but what I'm going to ask might be naive. So you started by saying you wanted to bracket. Right. He wanted to bracket the question of whether Jesus is God. And I wonder, that seems a little like standing on Highway 99 and saying, I'm going to, there's semi trucks and crazy bad drivers, meth heads coming at me, but I'm going to bracket the question of whether or not I'm going to die. Um, given what it says in the New Testament and what Pascal's wager says, it seems a little like a gamble to say I'm going to bracket. Question. So my question for you is, do you have highway moments where you're like, am I, am I betting on the wrong side? Yeah, great question. So did you all hear the question? No. <coughs> um, well, it's kind of hard for me to... <laughs> she thinks that it's... I said at the beginning I'm going to bracket the question whether Jesus is God in order to talk about the historical question of how Christians came to think that he was God. And she's saying, can you really do that? I mean, don't, aren't you kind of implicated in, in, in it? I mean, she, her, her analogy was like you're standing on Highway 99 and you're going to bracket the question about whether these cars that are coming barreling down upon you are actually going to hurt you or not. Uh, and uh, isn't it kind of like that? Um, and she mentioned Pascal's Wager, which, uh, if you all know Pascal's Wager, this, this idea uh, that um, Pascal developed, which is, that um, you know, if if um, if you say if you say that there is no God and you're wrong, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. So if you say that there is a God and you're wrong, you suffer no consequence. So the better bet. <laughs> the wager is, you say there is a God because you've got nothing to lose. That's Pascal's wager. Right? Am I paraphrasing that correctly? Yeah. Um, I used to be convinced by that, and I'm no longer convinced by it, because it's not simply a question 
you know, should you believe Jesus is God because otherwise you might roast in hell? Uh, well, what if you believe Jesus is God and the Muslims are right? Then you lose the wager. So you can't win the wager simply by saying, well, I'm going to believe Jesus is God because then I'm safe either way. And it's not just the Muslims. Uh, there's not like two options the way Pascal presented it. For Pascal, there basically were two options. But there aren't two options. There are hundreds of options. So everyone has to choose, and there's no safe bet. Yes? I left something out. Sorry. <laughs> I wanted to say that when you said in the practical question, on the one hand, I really admire that. I think it's really smart. On the other hand, I want to pull you off the freeway and keep you from getting hit by cars. I appreciate that. She, she's, trying, she's trying to save me, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, let me try to save you now. Uh, so, uh, just a second, I need to answer the question, because I, I think that um, when I say that I'm bracketing the question, I don't mean that in my own personal life, I don't think about it as a deal with it. I mean that when I'm presenting my study of how Jesus became God, I'm not taking a stand on the theological question, is he God or not? I think my book works whether you think Jesus is God or not. So I'm not presupposing that he's God to write my book, and I'm not presupposing that he's not God to write my book. I'm bracketing the theological question in order to engage in a historical analysis. If I don't do that, if I, if I, if I use my personal theology in order to do my history, then I'm not really doing history anymore. I'm just doing theology and calling it history. And so I want to do history. Over here on my right, uh, yes, uh, the gentleman <coughs> on the head, your hand up. Um, regarding, now again, your, your, your thesis is quite different from Daniel Boyarin's uh, book on the Gospel of Mark. Uh, are you familiar with it? Okay. So his thesis pretty much is that, you know, uh, the Trinity and, and whatnot, pretty much duality, come from the Canaanite religion. And uh, Jesus holds on to this ancient tradition uh, based off Daniel 7. Uh, and uh, is there any, my question is to you, is that you think, do you think there is any legitimate, legitimacy to, the, to his thesis, or is it just too, too far spread out? Um, right, so he's asking about a thesis of uh, Daniel Boyar, and who's a scholar of uh, early Judaism who teaches at Berkeley about uh, whether the gospel, in the gospel of Mark already you have some kind of Trinitarian thought based on earlier Canaanite religion that Jesus is an Arian. Is that a fair yes. summary? Yeah. And D Danny Boyarin is a friend of mine, uh, and he's one of the most brilliant people I know. Um, he also advances ideas that I think are a little bit out there. <laughs> and uh, this would be one of them. So I, I just, uh, right here tonight. Uh, I thought that, not all about my history here, but someone maybe Constantine, two or three hundred years after Jesus, they got together, they kind of set up, established Christianity, and there was a famous meeting or something that this was done. Yeah, you're referring to. I want to say the three years of Council of Nicaea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Uh, so, he, yeah. So, did Constantine establish Christianity uh, at the Council of Nicaea? So, Constantine was the first Christian, was the first Roman emperor to become a Christian. Um, he converted to Christianity in the year 312. Thirteen years later, he uh, was the Council of Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea was called in order to decide. In what sense is Christ God? The two options at the Council of Nicaea were, is Christ a subordinate divinity to God? That, that sometime in eternity past, God created Christ. God the Father created Christ. Christ then created the universe. So that Christ is, comes about in a certain point. Before, there was a time before which he did not exist. Or there was a time when he did not exist. And he came into existence. And 
he's secondary to God. He's not, he's not equal to God the Father. God the Father is God the Father. Christ is a secondary divinity who's more powerful and glorious and spectacular than anything else in the universe, but he's not nearly as spectacular and glorious and powerful as God the Father. That was one opinion. The other opinion was, no, Christ is co-eternal with God. He's always existed, and he's, he's equal with God. He's not a subordinate divinity. He didn't come into existence at some time. He's always been with God. He's always been the Son of God. He's completely equal with God. He's of the same substance as the Father. So those are the two arguments. Uh, both of them have a lot of philosophical reasoning behind them, and theological reasoning, and biblical reasoning. And uh, the second position won. The first position got condemned. So uh, Constantine supported the, the winning side. He really didn't care. He thought it was a bunch of trivial theological claptrap. He wasn't really interested in it. But, but he wanted the Christians to be unified. Uh, Constantine did not make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. He made it an acceptable religion. It had been persecuted on and off for years. He made it an acceptable religion. By the end of the 4th century, another Roman emperor, Theodosius I, made Christianity the official religion. Uh, and after Theodosius I, you couldn't be a pagan anymore and get away with it. You had to be Christian. <clears throat> Let me see. Uh, down here in the front. Okay. Uh, I want to turn to the issue of, of mass appearances. In your two of the debates with Michael and Donna, the first time you indicated that there was some kind of study about mass appearances happening. Then in your second one, you mentioned, well, same people think they see uh, mass appearances and nobody really believes it because it's the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, my question is, are there any studies? And secondly, what do you do when you're arguing against somebody who's not a conservative evangelical problem? Yeah, so this idea of being, having group visions, um, so are there any really any studies of this? And secondly, uh, that argument that I use that you know uh, only works with conservative evangelical Protestants because they don't believe in the Blessed Virgin Mary. Should. And what if I'm arguing with somebody else? Uh, I've never had this argument with anyone else, so uh, I'd probably have to have another argument. I mean, if I'm having an argument with a Roman Catholic apologist, that, that wouldn't work because they'd say, "Yeah, she does show up, so just like Jesus did." And so, uh, yeah, 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 all right. So, uh, so are there studies? There are studies, uh, and I, I actually give bibliography in my book. Uh, there are a number of uh, studies of, actually some really interesting ones, not just about the Blessed Virgin Mary, there, there's a really interesting account of Jesus showing up um, in, uh, in, in conservative Christian churches, where uh, there's one account that I give in this book that is really quite interesting, where they claim that there was a film of it, of, of Jesus showing up, but the film got lost. <laughs> but the guy writing the book doesn't believe any of it, but he actually saw the film before it got lost. And so it's really, it's pretty interesting stuff. So people do see things. So I guess if I was debating somebody else, I'd have to come up with some other examples. But I, I do get the bibliography in the book. Okay, thank you. It's the Angel Moroni part. That's, uh, yeah, the Angel Moroni, there, there you go. Yeah, right here, uh, I think I, uh, the person in black. Uh, I wanted to see, like, as a historian, have you ever, like, analyzed the, the point of, like, uh, looking at the Jesus as a son of God or prophet or uh, any of those kind of, like, what Islam has to say for it or Jewish people, they said, maybe Jewish people want to stop, like, uh, their religion, that's why they don't leave whatever is after it, or most of they believe it as a prophet. You're asking what the Jewish people at the time think of Jesus if they didn't believe that he was God? Is that, yeah. is that what you're asking? Yeah. Um, I think most, um, I mean, you know, it's not as if the Jews believe any thing. I mean, it's like, you know, what do the Americans think about abortion? Which American are you talking to? You know, and so it's kind of like that. So it's not like there's the Jewish view of, of anything. But um, I think in his day, most Jews would have interpreted Jesus as uh, somebody who was a, an apocalyptic preacher who was predicting that, that the end was going to come soon. And uh, those who were persuaded by that would consider him to be a prophet of God. Um, I think that Jews in his day would not have considered him to be the Messiah because he got crucified. And that was the last thing that was supposed to happen to a Messiah. The Messiah was supposed to 
overthrow the enemy, not get squashed by the enemy. Uh, if somebody did come to believe he was the Messiah, then they would be, they would, you know, they'd become, a, they'd be a Christian then. But they could still be a Jew. There were, there were plenty of Jews who became Christian and remained Jewish. In other words, they, they still kept the Sabbath, they still uh, ate kosher, they still do Jewish festivals, they circumcised the baby boys, and they still were Jewish in every way. Uh, but they, they were Jews who believed in Jesus. So I would say there was a kind of range of, of belief about what, you know, what Jesus was. But most, most Jews just rejected him. They just said, well, of course he's not the Messiah. I mean, obviously. Wow. Any more hands than we started off with. Uh, let's go over here. Uh, are your, is there one historically authenticated set of canonical gospels? And, and if not, is it in your view to depend on a particular version or translation of those gospels? Yeah, so he's asking, are there any kind of are there any his, historical gospels that you can rely on for historical information? So um, there are a lot of Gospels not in the New Testament. Um, a few years ago, I published a collection of all the non-canonical Gospels. Uh, I'm sorry. My question is, the four canonical Gospels... Yes, I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that. Yeah. But to get to them, I'm talking about the other ones. Uh, so uh, several years ago, I published uh, all of the other Gospels that are found in either Greek, Latin, or Coptic. Um, uh, so there are about 40 of them, either full Gospels or fragmentary Gospels. These other Gospels are not um, seen as historically reliable by anyone. No, nobody takes these. There, there might be a few things in a couple of them, like the Gospel of Thomas, that might be historical information. Uh, maybe something, a little bit in the Gospel of Peter. But basically, these other Gospels are ruled out. So that leaves the four. Um, among the four... It's usually thought that the Gospel of John is the last one and is more theologically developed than the other three. So that it's usually thought of as being less historically oriented than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mark is usually thought to be the earliest of the remaining three. And so if you have to pick one of the Gospels that has the most likelihood of containing historical information, it's usually thought to be Mark. But there's also historical information in Matthew and Luke. And so this is actually getting back to this question this fellow was asking earlier about, well, how do I know what Jesus said? Well, what you do is you take the surviving sources, and you take your earliest sources. You want the sources closest to the date. So if you have an account of Bill Clinton that's written like the next year, that's better than an account of Bill Clinton written 300 years later. right? You want something kind of close to the date, if possible. So you get to the earliest Gospels, and you try to see, are there materials in the Gospels that are uh, independently attested in them, where different Gospels, independently of each other, actually say something about Jesus that's the same. So that would be good. Uh, are there things in the Gospels that they say about Jesus that are contrary to what Christian storytellers would have, wanted to, would have wanted to say about him? That would mean they didn't invent it if they would have wanted to say it. So if you can find stuff like that, that would be historical. So what you have to do is apply historical criteria to these uh, in order to know what Jesus really said and did. That, does that answer your question? My, my question is more basic. Do we know exactly what was written in 70 AD in Mark? Do we know what the speaks about it? I see. Do we know what Mark actually wrote? Yes, that is a different question. And the answer is complicated. So um, I have a book called Misquoting Jesus. And the book of Misquoting Jesus is just on this question. Um, we don't have Mark's original. Um, Whatever Mark wrote, he put it in circulation and it probably got worn out and it got thrown away. Somebody made a copy of that, and we don't have that copy. And somebody made a copy of that copy. We don't have the copy of the copy. And we don't have a copy of the copy of the copy of the copy. The first copy of Mark that we have dates from around the year 200, so it's about 130 years later. It's fragmentary. It's only a portions of six chapters of Mark. Um, we don't have a first complete copy of Mark until about the year 350. So about 300 years after it was written. So it's been being copied for 300 years. And the problem, of course, is when people copy long documents, they make mistakes. And if you copy a copy that has a mistake, you copy the mistake, and then you make your own mistakes. And the professor comes along and copies your copy, which has mistakes of the two predecessors, and they copy those mistakes and make their own mistake. And the only time a mistake gets corrected is if somebody realizes, oh, that's a mistake, and they try to correct it. 
But there's no way of knowing whether the correction is, is correct. It might correct it incorrectly. In which case, you get the original, you get the mistake, and you have the mistake, and correction of the mistake. And it goes on like that for 300 years. So, so there are scholars. Uh, this is actually my, my main field of scholarship for years. For 20 years, this is what I worked on. How do you know what the original said? And uh, so this is, this is like one of my areas of expertise. And I think, you know, by and large, we have so many copies of the New Testament that by and large, we can be, we're pretty close. We're, we're as close as we're ever going to be. We, we can never know for sure. We cannot know for sure if we have the exact wording. And there are places where we just don't agree with each other. The scholars don't agree in a number of places. Uh, we have thousands of copies. These thousands of copies have hundreds of thousands of differences in them. So you've got to figure out what the original is. But, you know, there are scholars who devote their lives to this. And we're pretty close, I would think. As close as we I don't know if we're close. But we're just, we're not going to get any closer. I'm going to go back over here. Yeah, gentlemen in blue. Is there any agreement, or do we know what language Jesus really spoke? And is, is that important, what, what language he spoke and his companions spoke for understanding the history of God? Yeah. What, do we know what language Jesus spoke, and if so, is that, is that important for understanding anything about, about him and his sayings? And uh, the answer is yes. There's not, not really any dispute about this. Jesus spoke Aramaic, which was the language of Palestine in the first century. There's, uh, there, in my opinion, there's nothing to suggest that he knew Greek or Latin. The Gospels are written in Greek. So uh, the sayings of Jesus that you read in your English Bible are English translations of Greek texts and if they actually go back to Jesus, the sayings of Jesus in the Greek New Testament, they're translations from Aramaic into Greek. There are some sayings of Jesus in the New Testament in Greek that cannot be translated back into Aramaic, which shows Jesus must not have said that, at least in that way. There are other sayings of Jesus in the New Testament that make better sense if you translate them back into Aramaic. Let me give you an example. Uh, there's this famous saying of Jesus uh, where Jesus says, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Okay? You all know that saying? Sabbath was made for man, not man for Sabbath. But he's just healed somebody, and the Pharisees are all upset because he's healed somebody on the Sabbath. He says, he says look, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. The thing is, that saying doesn't make any sense. I tell my students that when they read a passage of the a verse in the New Testament and they, they see the word therefore, they need to ask, what is the therefore, therefore? <laughs> Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Why does that make the Son of Man the Lord of the Sabbath? That doesn't make sense. But if you put it back into Aramaic, the word for man, human being, and the word for Son of Man is the same word. Baranash is the Aramaic word. Sabbath was made for Baranash, not Baranash for the Sabbath. Therefore, Baranash is the Lord of the Sabbath. Now it makes sense. But it's only if you put it back in the Aramaic. And so uh, people who are really like into this, uh, kind of trying to establish the words of Jesus, they really have to be able to do, do that kind of retroversion from the Greek back in the Aramaic. Um, let's see. Way over here, man in the green hat. What was your original motivation to become a, a scripture scholar of such detail? And what is your own personal religious history and that of your family? <laughs> <laughs> Why did I become a scripture scholar and what is my religious history? Right, okay. Uh, those two do go together. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the very short version. Uh, I was raised in the Episcopal Church, uh, and I was a devoted uh, Episcopalian as a child. Um, when I was in high school, I had a born-again experience and became a conservative evangelical Christian. Um, I, was, I was a fundamentalist. I went to a fundamentalist Bible college, Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, uh, where the Bible was our middle name. <laughs> so, uh, 
And so I got interested in the study of the Bible at Moody Bible Institute. I took my first semester class, my first semester in college, 17 years old. I'm sitting in a class on the Gospel of John. Uh, and about three weeks into this class, I'm thinking, this guy who's teaching the class, he's, he's actually getting paid to do that. I want to do that. <laughs> and so starting when I was 17, I decided I wanted to become a scholar of the Bible. Um, when I left Moody, graduated from Moody, I went to Wheaton College, uh, where I did Greek as my, my foreign language, because I wanted to read the New Testament in Greek. Um, and I was pretty good at it, and so I thought I wanted to uh, study the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament for uh, graduate work. So the scholar who was the expert in Greek manuscripts for the New Testament was a man named Bruce Metzger. He was the, the, world, the world's best scholar of this. Uh, he taught at Princeton Theological Seminary. So I went to Princeton Theological Seminary to do my master's with him. Uh, and I stayed on and did a PhD with him, uh, working on Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. While I was at Princeton, I, I learned Hebrew, so I was reading the Old Testament in Hebrew, I was reading the New Testament in Greek, and I started finding problems. Uh, discrepancies, contradictions, historical mistakes. Uh, you read it deeply enough and you find these things. I ended up leaving my views that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, and I, I just came to think that the Bible is a very human book. Uh, but I was still a Christian. I remained a Christian for years, many years. I was a pastor of a Baptist church in Princeton, New Jersey for a year. Uh, so I, mean, I was still actively in the church, but I wasn't considering myself an evangelical Christian any longer. Um, I ended up leaving the faith altogether about... Um, 15, 18 years ago, uh, but it was unconnected to my scholarship. Uh, the reason I left Christianity was because I, uh, I had been wrestling with the problem of suffering, and I got to a point where I simply didn't think there was a God who was active in this world, given all the pain and misery in it. Um, you know, in a world where a child starves to death every five seconds, I just came to think, you know, I don't believe there's a God who's active, who answers prayer, who intervenes on behalf of his people. I just don't believe it anymore. I knew what people said. I mean, you know, I read what the Bible scholars said, I read what the theologians said, I read what the philosophers said. I just didn't buy it anymore. And so I decided, probably 18, 17, 18 years ago, I wasn't. I just didn't believe in God anymore. So now I'm going to I'm going to uh, uh, cut off the question period now. I'm very sorry. I will, yeah. Um, I do want to put in a plug for philosophy right there at the end, though. This, this uh, uh, problem that convinced uh, Bart to leave Christianity uh, is called the problem of evil, and it's at the center of a lot of what we teach in philosophy. Right? So if you want to go deeper into it and you're a student, uh, or if you want to be a student, uh, Fred City College allows anybody to come and uh, uh, indulge in lifelong learning. Uh, take a philosophy class and we will discuss this uh, issue, right? My philosophical <laughs> colleagues are sitting over there. Okay, uh, I want to give uh, Dr. Urban the last word here. For one thing, uh, he has a wonderful uh, story about a uh, charitable cause that he's involved in that he wants to tell you about. Right, so I just want to close with this uh, because I like to advertise this as much as I can. Uh, I, have a, I have a blog that I keep. Uh, it's just, uh, you look it up on the internet, just look for the Bart Urban blog. Um, this blog deals with uh, everything having to do with early Christianity. All the questions you ask me here, people ask me on the blog, and I answer them. Uh, and many, many more. Um, I blog uh, five or six times a week, uh, a thousand words a shot. So every week, there's five or six uh, posts that are a thousand words long. People ask me questions, I get 30 or 40 questions. I get 30 or 40 comments that I post. And if there's a question, I try to answer, but I answer very quickly. I don't have time to, to do much more than that. Um, the thing about this blog is that it's a membership blog. You have to, you have to pay to join. Uh, it costs $24.95 for a year's subscription to the blog. Um, but I do it not to lie in my own pockets. In fact, I don't take any of the money myself. I give all the money away to charities dealing with hunger and homelessness. Uh, and so the only reason I do this is to raise money. Uh, if it weren't to raise money, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> it's too much work. I've really got better things to do with my time. But I do it because I can get people to join the blog, and I can raise money for charity. 
Uh, last year, I raised $117,000 uh, on this book. So, uh, <laughs> my view about suffering, um, uh, which is absolutely, it is, this is the fundamental philosophical question in many ways. Uh, my view of suffering is that um, ultimately, there's really not a good answer. Um, I, but I think that even if you can't, even if there's not an answer, there can be a response. And the response that I support is that we actually try to do something about it, which means helping out those who are in, especially those in dire need. And so that's why I do this blog. So I just, I would encourage you to uh, Google the blog, look up, look up Barter from blog, and, and think about joining. If you, if you wanted to just try it out, you can have a shorter period of time for less money. But it's less, you know, basically it's less than 50 cents a week. Uh, so it's not a lot of money, and you get, you get a lot for it. And every dime goes to charity. So, anyway, thank you very much. I've enjoyed being with you.